Welcome to the problem of the day. I feel like I've been going through a series of problems, and this is going to be one more, but it will be the last one, where I say thermodynamics says x, but we're going to do y. So let's do that again. Today we are going to focus on the idea of solubility and solids. So that is when we're talking about a phase equilibrium that comes about because something is dissolving into something else, usually a vapor or a solid into a liquid, um, or when solids are at equilibrium uh, with a liquid, or heck, a vapor, why not? So it is still true that at equilibrium, Fi, the fugacity of uh, substance I, in phase alpha is going to be equal to the fugacity of substance I in phase beta. And those may be solids, liquids, or uh, gases. And they may be uh, when we're talking about something that is dissolving just as much as when we're talking about something that is the bulk phase. Uh, it's still true. Okay? So it's nice to have something we can go back to that's like true all the time. Yay us. Um, but even though that is true, it's not always um, useful. <laughs> it's not only useful uh, for for a few issues, for a few reasons that make this uh, that make this complicated. Um, one is that the writing a um, a activity model out for your particular substance in each phase could be uh, very bulky, could be very big, could be very complicated, could involve stuff that you just don't know. And perhaps the group contribution methods don't work as well in say your system because you're looking at a solid. Uh, so they tend to be inconvenient to apply. Um, we would still write this out as modified Reynolds law uh, for A and B. And I'm assuming at the moment that neither A nor B, alpha nor beta is a vapor. Uh, so you would have the, say, two liquid phases or a solid phase and a liquid phase. And you have Xi gamma I Pi sat is equal to Xi gamma I Pi sat, whereas the Xi and gamma I for uh, phase alpha are different than for phase beta. The P sats end up canceling out. But as I alluded to a moment ago, Writing an expression for the activity, for the gamma on one side and the gamma on the other side, uh, can be very fraught. Uh, activity models are big and they are bulky and they are not always uh, well suited for describing a solid. And sometimes even when they are, they are not um, easy to find the uh, parameters for. And so, uh, quite often, this kind of modeling tends to be the domain of uh, people working with theory or people doing fundamental research, uh, while people who are working in chemical plants uh, tend to use shortcut methods uh, that get at the immediate question they want to know, which is, how much of this stuff is going to dissolve? So let's talk about that a little bit more. To understand why this is so tricky for solids, it helps to think about uh, the three-ish different flavors of solid that exist. And this may be something that you have discussed in, uh, say, a polymer science course or a material science course, or maybe you're hearing it for the first time here. Uh, I'm going to give this in broad brush strokes. There is a lot of sub-detail that one could go into. In fact, an entire course of some detail that one could go into. So I'm going to give you the five minute version. Here we go. So one kind of solid that you encounter frequently is what I'd call a thermoset or a solid that has been formed by cross-linking or by just molecules that are really, really big and kind of knotted together. So these things are not solid in the sense that they have frozen from a liquid or that you could melt them ever again. Um, they don't work like that. A example of this is cooking an egg. So if you have an egg, uh, it's a protein solution in water is a way to think about it. As you heat that up, 
the proteins denature and get all tangled with each other and to some extent cross-link. So, right, you heat up an egg, it becomes solid. You heat up an ice cube, it does not become solid, it becomes a liquid, it goes in the other direction. So uh, that's how you know when you have something as kind of like a thermoset uh, or a, a cross-linked sort of solid. And you, we are surrounded by things that behave in this way. Uh, for example, you know, it's not like wood is a crystal. Um, so that's, uh, that is one class of solids that are out there. Then there's the two different-ish solids that do melt and freeze. Um, and they are on a continuum with each other. The first I would call amorphous solids, and the second, or actually third, because we had a, one thing listed before this, is crystalline solids. And so uh, a crystalline solid is you have, you, the stuff was melted, and then you cooled it down and crystals grew. And the amorphous one is what happens if, uh, quite often, if you cool it very fast, often, or, uh, or you mix it around a lot, that you don't grow uh, crystals in their really nice crystal formation. They don't, uh, the molecules end up in solid formation, but they're not in their absolute lowest energy configuration. They are not stacked as neatly as they'd like to be if they were truly at a, a perfect and beautiful equilibrium with their surroundings. You've kind of quenched it and sort of trapped them as they are. That's an amorphous solid. And one of the ways you know you have an amorphous solid is it's easier to melt. It takes less energy to melt than the, the corresponding crystalline solid. So crystalline solid uh, has had a chance to uh, grow and each molecule that sticks onto the, uh, the crystal um, goes in its precise uh, lowest energy spot. And this is a composition, things can have degrees of crystallinity. Um, quite often you have you know, things that are somewhat amorphous or somewhat crystalline in the middle. And the point here is that you can trap a solid in a non-equilibrium configuration, whereas that kind of trapping tends to be really difficult to do with vapors and somewhat difficult to do with liquids. Uh, usually on, in the course of hours, sometimes days, these move to their uh, equilibrium configurations, whereas a solid you can trap in a um, non-equilibrium state uh, for years. Um, and you can also kind of form a equilibrium state and then you know, change its temperature and it doesn't immediately change. So the, the sort of math that we talk about that applies to everything, fugacity equals fugacity, it really describes pretty well what's going on in what I just circled and put, you know, thermo exclamation point. Those crystalline solids are well explained by the kind of equilibrium math we've been doing. Fugacity equals fugacity. It's got that. It is less well explained for the amorphous solids, and we have to look at a whole different kind of realm of thinking about reactions uh, and uh, kinetics when we're looking at cross-linking. So really, when we're talking about solids, we're, we're thinking often in the crystalline range. Okay, so for the reasons I have discussed, uh, we find that fugacity equals fugacity is often uh, somewhere between inconvenient or not even relevant that much to use uh, when we are talking about dissolving a solid in a liquid, and it's often not convenient when we're dissolving a gas in a liquid. So when we're talking about dissolving thing A and thing B, uh, we will often move to something that's a bit more uh, pragmatic and a bit more empirical than doing a full-on uh, kind of derived first principles activity model for our situation. Now, when we are thinking about a solid uh, dissolving in a liquid, we will tend to turn to solubility, which uh, is something that people measure experimentally. You can model it. It is modeled, um, and people think about, you know, what's the delta H and the delta S as things dissolve. This is 100% uh, part of the literature. 
but it still results in something where you can have a, a mass dissolved in a particular volume uh, and you have a constant for this or uh, ideally a temperature dependent relation because as temperature goes up usually the solubility of a solid and a liquid also increases. On the gas side, we tend to use something called Henry's Law. And Henry's Law uh, reflects the fact that uh, you can have a constant that is equal to the um, mole fraction or concentration of a given gas dissolved in the liquid uh, divided by the initial partial pressure of that gas uh, over the liquid. So that's, that's the equilibrium that we're looking at there. And depending on which source you go to, the uh, numerator in that fraction might be a mole fraction or it might be a concentration in say maybe grams per liter or moles per kilogram of solution. Um, it really depends on your source. And vapors, this is thermodynamics here, uh, will have less solubility as temperature goes up. So as the temperature increases, you uh, lose gases. So uh, as you warm up oxygen, or as you warm up water, there is less oxygen in it, there's less CO2 in it. Um, so let's try this as a problem. Uh, I'm working with Senior Design. A couple years ago, we were working with Rusty Rail, which is a brewery down the road in Mifflinburg. And uh, they carbonate their beer using uh, high pressure CO2. So they have a, a big sealed tank and they pump it full of CO2 and they wait for it to dissolve and they end up with carbonated beer. Uh, a typical carbonation ratio that you might use for beer is two. Uh, and what that means is if you were just looking at volumes, and this is a really obnoxious way to do it, but it's how, how folks think about it industrially, you would have twice the volume of CO2 than the volume of beer that you started with. Does that make sense? So at a given temperature. So let's say we were at 10 degrees Celsius. Uh, if Rusty Rail is using pure CO2, what pressure should they apply to get that much CO2 dissolved uh, into their product? And the Henry's Law constant from the NIST web book, which is always a great place to look for information, uh, is 0 0.035 moles per kilogram bar. So watch those units and consider uh, what it is that that value is telling you. And by the way, uh, as noted earlier, that constant that I'm giving you is temperature dependent, but I'm giving you the constant that ought to work at the temperature of this problem. All right, go for it.